Good evening, black people and all allies fighting for black liberation, black prosperity, and black joy. I'm Charles Flo, and welcome to Prime. Today, we commemorate and honor the life and work of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., exalted for his commitment to civil rights, economic equality, and the freedom for all. He is one of the most remarkable Americans this country has ever produced. His leadership of the Montgomery bus boycott and the March on Washington and his service as the first president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference helped secure passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Both bills fundamentally improved the lives of black people in this country while revolutionizing black politics. Ironically, for a nation founded on democracy, the Voting Rights Act was considered one of the far most far-reaching pieces of civil rights legislation at the time of its passage, and voting rights have been under attack ever since. The weapon used against voting rights? The filibuster. Dr. King himself was critical of the filibuster, saying in a 1963 press conference, the tragedy is that we have a Congress with the Senate that has a minority of misguided senators who will use the filibuster to keep the majority of people from even voting. Dr. King's son, Martin Luther King III, has organized a campaign to pressure the Senate to pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act and the Freedom to Vote Act to ensure fair and equitable elections. Dubbed No Celebration Without Legislation, it calls for the public on MLK Day to urge those in the Senate to end the filibuster's blockage of voting rights legislation in lieu of celebrating. Joining us to discuss the legacy of Dr. King and the fight for voting rights, past and present, is co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, Bishop William Barber. Bishop Barber, first, I just want to, before we dive into the politics, to, to just give us your reflections on the importance of Dr. King himself on this day. Charles, thank you for that question. Let me go into the Bible and quote one passage of scripture that we ought to always remember and we deal with prophetic voices like Dr. King. This is Matthew chapter 23, where Jesus says, woe unto those who love the tombs of the prophets. One of the great dangers in remembering people like Dr. King is either to idolize them as an individual. He was not an individual. He was a part of a community. He often said that his voice was the amplification of the voices of many thousands for many, many years. <clears throat> and a lot of people love the tombs of the prophets when they're safely dead. And then what happens in the tomb, <clears throat> we start getting bits and pieces pulled out about their memory. And a lot of time that's driven by a kind of corporate memory bank. But I mean corporate profiteers, because they don't want us to remember real profits and real, uh, real positions. So on this day, we need to grab a hold of the radical Martin Luther King. We need to remember when he said, we must also realize that the problems of racial injustice and economic injustice cannot be solved without a radical redistribution of political and economic power. We must remember that Dr. King that said the, mad, the great fear of the Southern aristocracy was the masses of Negro and white people, poor people joining together, forming a powerful coalition that could redo the economic architecture of the nation. We must get a hold of the Dr. King that when he finished speaking at Riverside, 72% of white Americans did not like him. 50% of black Americans did not like him. Almost every civil rights group wrote resolutions against him, and he lost his invitation to the White House. This is where he was when he said, started talking about the two Americas, and he joined with the welfare rights women and others to call for a mass poor people's campaign. And so on this day, we must remember, but we must be careful that we don't dismember, dismember the legacy of Dr. King and end up making him something that he was not. And he was never an isolated issue person. He always talked in multiple issues. And even if you look at that march from Selma to Montgomery, he never submerged race, but the, that march had Jews, Muslims, Christians, white and black, and he always connected the economics and the race and the power building. And we have to make sure that we don't lose that when we talk about Dr. King. That's, that's an excellent point. 
Now, I just want to shift quickly uh, to the politics of the moment. The voting rights bills are expected to fail this week. Is there any chance that they don't? Well, you never know. I, I, I want to tell you the first big mistake that we, some people made, is you don't allow politicians to set the deadline on your victory. The, the campaigns of the movement, like Birmingham, Montgomery, they never allowed the politicians or the oppressors to say when the, the campaign was over or when they would, you know, win. They would, their basis was, you know, our deadline is victory. So part of the problem is, and you've talked about this, we should have done this right out of the bat, out of the gate. We should have never separated, and we've been saying this, the infrastructure of our democracy, which was voting, the infrastructure of our daily lives, which was investment in poor and low-wealth people, we, some people call it BBB, which is which was a, it's a step in the right direction. It isn't the final, fundamental, most transformative thing. It's not even really that radical, $190 million a year uh, um, you know, to, to invest in poor and low-wealth people, billion dollars, excuse me, and then the infrastructure of our roads and bridges. But we didn't do that. We, they were separated. Now here we are. So I don't know. I really don't. But what I do know, it doesn't matter. And what I mean by that, and I don't want to be flippant, even if those bills pass tomorrow, let's tell the folks some truth, Charles. Number one, the Freedom to Vote Act has been so watered down from what John Lewis originally wrote in the For the People's Act. And that's shameful in itself to have allowed Manchin to do that. Number two, the delay of not do, trying to pass until now has allowed 19 states to pass bills that, that can't be, that, and, and, and gerrymandering plans. And the gerrymandering plans, you, there's no grandfather clauses in these two bills that will allow you to go back and undo them. So the delay has, is a part of what I think Manchin and Cinema was trying to do, give these states time to pass some things. The next thing we should know is that the Freedom to Vote Act, I don't like that because we have a right to vote, the Freedom for the Vote Act, for the first time in history, codifies voter ID as a necessary part of voter integrity. And, Charles, it only covers federal elections, which means even this bill, that if it's passed, it does not cover state and local elections. So do we want to do it? Yes. Is it the important? Yes. Oh, and also, we have to look more deeply at, even if we pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act Amendment, what is the new formula? Some, some writing says that a state has to have 15 cases over the last 25 years fully adjudicated through the courts to even be covered under the new formula. Well, how many states actually have that? So even if we win it, there's a lot of work still to be done. If they don't pass, then we need to do what we have to do to put the pressure on, not just for voting, but for economic inf uh, investment, and, and we really need to say we want for the people back on the table, and then we're going to fight in the streets and in the suites and at the ballot box. So I said no matter what happens Dr. tomorrow— Dr. King spoke uh, about the usage of the filibuster to suppress voting rights in 1963. All yeah. these years later, little has changed about the use of the filibuster. Talk to us about the tragedy of that fact. Yeah. Well, there are a couple of ones. Can I add one name? Moderate. Because also it was in 63, in a letter from the Birmingham jail, that Martin Luther King said that moderates were the greatest disappointment and problem for the civil rights movement. He said because they are more devoted into order than they are justice. Also, this filibustering is non-constitutional. It really means, in one language, a form of piracy. And Manchin, is, he keeps saying he's acting like Robert Byrd. He is lying. He is acting like John Calhoun, because the James Calhoun, because um, Robert Byrd didn't even like this kind of filibuster. This is a coward filibuster, where you don't have to stand on the floor and fight and keep talking. John Calhoun in the 1850s was the one that actually believed in the role, the privileged role of minorities. That he said the Southern states had a privileged role. And, and, and the filibuster from that standpoint has been used over the years to block anti-slavery laws, to block women's rights, to block suffer, uh, women's suffrage, labor. The filibuster just has a nasty, mean, a regressive history. 
And the fact that we're still even dealing with this in the United States uh, Senate and that Manchin and Cinema have picked it up along with McConnell is, is just wrong. And the fact that the president and others didn't start out, first of all, putting a face on this problem and going to West Virginia. You know, we begged them, go to West Virginia, go to Arizona, bring some moral leaders into the Oval Office, bring impacted people, and then give them the mic and show how this filibuster is hurting all people. We're talking about the filibuster, uh, Charles, is blocking 31 million families from getting child income tax credit, 6 million families from getting health care, uh, uh, 17 million families from getting economic uh, 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 earned income tax credit. It, this filibuster is going to allow 55 million Americans to lose the processes they used to vote in 2020 because of the new new bills that are being that are passed in the state. The filibuster is hurting 45. The poor and lower people make up 45 percent of the voting bloc in 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 um in battleground states. That's what this filibuster, and the filibuster, lastly, is protecting the, the agenda of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, which is two. They want to block voting rights to disable, disempower the ability of people to vote so that they can then put people in office that will pass policies that will allow them to basically control who benefits from the $21 trillion gross domestic product. That's how ugly this filibuster is, and it has no place in our American society. Bishop Barber, I want to thank you, as always, for joining us tonight. Happy MLK Day. And it is great to see that you have recovered from your bout with COVID. Thank you so much, sir.